Good afternoon. I'm Peter Tefano. I'm the dean of the school, and welcome to Said Business School, and welcome to Oxford. Your Highnesses, Your Excellencies, honored guests, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I'm delighted to welcome the Right Honorable Brian Mulroney to, and his wife, Myla Mulroney, to Oxford and to Said Business School. Um, Mr. Mulroney was the 18th Prime Minister of Canada and served from 1984 to 1993. Under his leadership, Canada moved forward in, by leaps and bounds, and at least in three dimensions, he's been uh, noted uh, for the progress that the country has made in terms of economic performance, in terms of env environmental issues, and in terms of international trade. There's a special relationship between Canada and the UK, and another special relationship between Canada and the United States, where I come from. In one case, we, we share a border, in another case, a commonwealth, and in all three cases, a language, Almost. Um, so why here? Why is it that Prime Minister Mulroney is here at a business school? Um, it's not because we have a nice venue, although I think we do. Um, I think it's because the whole essence of this business school is about recognizing that the, the boundaries between business and everything else are very porous. The boundaries between business and government, the boundaries between business and society. In each case, business doesn't sit alone from everything else. And therefore, we see ourselves as being a school that is embedded in the university, an expression that we use. And what that really means is that we want to make sure that we reach out across not only the university, but the world to understand what's going on. And Mr. Mulroney is a leader not only in government, but he's also been quite successful in law, in business, in civil society. And his leadership in all of these areas will give him a point of view that we can learn from. Uh, as well as his comments about the, the world as it is today. Before I pass it over to Mr. Mulroney, what I'd like to also do is to recognize Mr. Said and Mrs. Said, who are here in the front. It's their tireless support of this school and our mission that allows us to do things like today, to sit in this building and to do all that we do. So thank you so much, Wafik and Rosemary. Uh, Mr. Mulroney, before you come up, um, yeah, I see you have cufflinks on, but there's a tradition in Oxford that people usually have cufflinks. Wear the Said cufflinks with pride someday. <laughs> Mr. Mulroney, all yours. Thank you very much. Thanks so much. If they're from Wafik, they're good cufflinks. <laughs> they're from me. <laughs> I see. They're not so good cufflinks. You, you'll learn. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, my old friend Chris, I'm an ambassador, and uh, I thought I saw Michael here as well. Oh, here we are. How nice to see you all, and thank you all uh, for, for being here. Uh, a month ago, at one of Canada's great universities, I watched as Wafiq Saeed was granted a Doctor of Laws degree. The university chancellor spoke of the outstanding career and magnificent philanthropic leadership of Wafik and Rosemary, both here and around the world. His comments were particularly moving to the thousands of people who were in that auditorium that day, as he described all they are doing most recently to assist the refugees, sick, bloodied, maimed, and devastated, whose families have been destroyed by the brutality of the Syrian wars. To do what they did requires a sensitive understanding of the human condition, a resolve to improve it, and an incredible sense of generosity to bring relief and comfort to those suffering and in constant agony and pain, having lost not only their country, but their families. And so for this, and for your many kindnesses to us all. Wafik and Rosie, I say simply, on behalf of us all, we are honored to be in your company. I was telling someone who didn't have a political career how um, bizarre it is when you leave after a long time in office. And in my case, in fact, I mentioned to Wafik in Canada, uh, the first trip that I made after I retired as Prime Minister, 
uh, was to Orlando, Florida for a board meeting. I got on the plane in Montreal and got caught in a huge snowstorm. It was diverted on Northwest Airlines to Detroit. And as I got off the plane and walked into the Detroit International Airport, a woman from VIP services was there and she said, Prime Minister Mulroney, go right over there, get on that electric cart, it's gonna take you to the end of the airport and you'll make a connecting flight for Orlando. And I said, well, thank you very much. The cart is right ahead of me being guarded by a guy about 18 years old, 6'5", 250 pounds. And just as I move towards it, a woman who was behind me in the lineup runs right in front and she says to him, I have to have that cart right now. And he says, you cannot have that cart. She says, why not? He said, this cart is reserved for the former dictator from Canada. <laughs> oh God, how quickly they forget. In fact, uh, when uh, the present Prime Minister of Canada, Stephen Harper, who used to work for me, uh, got elected, he called me and asked me if I had any advice, and I said, well, uh, not really, Stephen, but uh, all Prime Minister, I've noticed that all Prime Ministers of Canada uh, need to learn a little humility. Uh, that didn't apply to me, but to all the others. <laughs> and I, I said, the illustration of this was uh, Mr. Diefenbaker, who was elected Prime Minister of Canada in 1957, a conservative. And he made his first speech outside of Ottawa after his swearing in at the, uh, in the Oval Room of the Ritz-Carlton Hotel in Montreal for uh, the annual meeting of La Chambre de Commerce du Montréal Métropolitain, which is a big deal in uh, Montreal and in Canada. And uh, so he was there at the head table on the dais, and he was talking to the chairman of the Chambre de Commerce. And the waiter goes by with these little pincettes at the Ritz, and he puts down a piece of butter on his plate. And Mr. Diefenbaker turns and says, eh, excuse me, sir, I'll have another piece of butter. The waiter said, I'm sorry, sir, it's one piece of butter per person. Diefenbaker said, do you know who I am? The waiter said, no. He said, I'm the Right Honorable John Diefenbaker, the new Prime Minister of Canada, and I want another piece of butter. The waiter says to Diefenbaker, do you know who I am? <laughs> Diefenbaker says, no. He said, I'm the guy who gives out the butter. <laughs> <laughs> Of course, as we all know, those of us who've been involved in politics, uh, that, you know, when you, what do you miss when you leave? Well, you miss the adulation. <laughs> all those lovely editorials every morning. <laughs> Gushing support and affection. They're pretty tough. But most of all, we, we miss the, the gratitude of the voters. <laughs> And a couple of months after I left office, uh, 24 Sussex is the Prime Minister's official residence there. It's called 24 Sussex, guarded by the RCMP. And the guy walks up to the RCMP officer on duty and said, I'd like to see Prime Minister Mulroney. And the guard very politely said, well, sir, Mr. Mulroney is no longer Prime Minister. The guy says, oh, okay, and he leaves. Next day he's back and he asked to see Prime Minister Mulroney and the guy again says, Look, I've told you, Brian Mulroney is no longer Prime Minister. Again, the guy walks off and comes back and says to the same guard on the third day, I'd like to see Prime Minister Mulroney. And the guard's now a little annoyed, and he says, Sir, I have told you, Brian Mulroney is no longer Prime Minister. Don't you understand that? The guy said, Oh, yes, I do. I just enjoy hearing it. <laughs> 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 
well, we'll be here all night, so I better, <laughs> I better move on. The fundamental goal of government is to make a better world, a world that is safe from war and safe for democracy, a world that is free from deprivation and free from degradation. For 40 years, the United States and the Soviet Union were the world's two superpowers, the leaders of the West and East, of NATO and the Warsaw Pact, the keepers in President Kennedy's words of a cold and a bitter peace. And then in 1985, there came to power in the Kremlin a man named Mikhail Gorbachev, who questioned the assumptions of the Soviet system, ended the arms race and ultimately the Cold War, disbanded the East Bloc, the Warsaw Pact, and finally the tyranny of the Soviet Federation itself. I remember sitting across a conference table from him in a private meeting in the Kremlin just hours after he had assumed office in March of 1985. And I have to tell you, I never ever thought that it would be possible. There he was across the table, flanked by Andre Gromyko. You remember, warm, cuddly, affectionate. Andre Gromyko. Well, he, this new leader, spoke to me with confidence of the future, but gave precious few indications of the convulsive changes he was about to unleash. So profound, as it turned out, that he and his administration and his federation would be consumed by them. For Canada and the United Kingdom, the post-Cold War world offered unique opportunities and daunting challenges. We begin from a common heritage of democratic traditions and a common defense of liberty. There are reminders of that from the trenches of one war to the beaches of the next, places inscribed in the history of valor where Canadians and British have fought together and where Canadians and British have died together in the defense of freedom. And because we and our allies have remained true to those values and had the courage and the strength to defend them in NATO and Korea and the Middle East and elsewhere. Within the last 25 years, the Berlin Wall fell and Germany was reunited. A trade unionist from Gdansk became president of Poland, an electrician like my father. And a dissident poet sat in the castle in Prague as communist regimes tumbled like dominoes across Central and Eastern Europe. And in the second, the second Russian Revolution. The people of Moscow made a human wall around their parliament and Soviet tanks that had crushed every single stirring of liberty for 70 years, now for the first time, dared not cross. Strong political leadership at that time ensured that we came safely through the worst, as President Reagan said to the British Parliament in quoting Winston Churchill. If the United States is to maintain its role of world leadership in political and security matters, and in my judgment, it is vital that it does, it must ensure that its great economy does not falter or fail, because such failure would soon jeopardize and ultimately vitiate the American capacity to persuade other nations to share in its prescriptions for peace and prosperity around the world. Because as we know, our world changed perhaps forever because a handful of terrorists flew planes into American landmarks on a beautiful Tuesday morning in September 14 years ago, killing 3,000 innocent men, women, and children. As The Economist observed, seven decades ago, a generation of startled Americans awoke to discover that their country was under attack. Pearl Harbor changed America and therefore the world. And now the children and the grandchildren of the Americans who went to war in 1941 have suffered their own day of infamy, one that is no less memorable. The appalling atrocities of September 11th, acts that must be seen as a declaration of war, not just on America, but on all civilized people, were crueler in conception and even more shocking than what happened in Hawaii. September 11th has changed America, and with it, the world once again. Today, we face new th 
threats to global stability. Russia has flagrantly violated international law with its seizure of Crimea and parts of eastern Ukraine, threatening the relative peace that Europe has enjoyed for 70 years. And now we have ISIL marauding aggressively in Iraq and Syria and spreading its tentacles into Africa and even into Western countries like yours and mine. Radical terrorists are seeking to inflict horror on innocent people and destroy our democratic ideals. From the Middle East to the streets of Boston, to the media rooms of Paris, to the halls of the Canadian Parliament, an evil and implacable enemy lurks and advances. The enemy, this enemy, clearly despises Christians and Jews and Muslims and wants nothing less than their domination and elimination of these moderate people from the face of the earth. This enemy decapitates Christians, but let us not forget that it also burns alive in a steel cage a young fellow Muslim and murders thousands more elsewhere simply because their philosophy is different from their neighbors. This enemy must be resisted, and it will, by all of us who value freedom, strongly, loudly, and immediately. And the signs of leadership emanating from the Muslim leadership around the world are the most encouraging political developments that I have seen in this area in three years. A word of caution at the outset of the following remarks. As a former prime minister, I am reminded of what Gladstone once said referring to Peel. Namely, that former prime ministers are like untethered rafts drifting around the harbor, a menace to shipping. <laughs> so I'll try and be careful because at least two of Prime Minister Cameron's important challenges resulting from the last election is going to ring lots of bells with Canadians. The manner in which the United Kingdom deals with the question of Scottish independence is something that Canada has dealt with for 40 years, involving a similar initiative from Quebec, our second largest province, and the only French-speaking majority government in North America. Canada is a successful country of 36 million people spread over the second largest landmass after Russia in the world. From our beginnings as a French colony discovered by Jacques Cartier in 1534, to our evolution as a British dominion in 1759, to our roots as an independent nation in 1867, Canada has proven to be a land of tolerance, opportunity, and prosperity. In 1840, Lord Durham, dispatched to North America by Her Majesty, described French and English Canadians as two nations warring within the bosom of a single state, which was true. And so what did we do? We emerged as a federal state to accommodate both French and English-speaking realities, and compromises and flexibility have been therefore hallmarks of our national character ever since. For 148 years, through two Quebec referenda seeking independence, we have somehow muddled through and remain today a thriving, greatly admired and united country, most of whose citizens view themselves among the most fortunate in the world. So, why the thrust for independence and separation in Scotland or in, in Quebec? Well, essentially, from what I understand, for reasons of language and culture and politics. The argument, for example, being that only Quebec independence, by way of illustration, can protect a flourishing culture and language, uniquely French, among a sea of 365 million English-speaking people on the North American continent. But if that were true, how did the French language population of Canada grow from 90,000 on the 13th of September, 1759, the day of the British conquest, 
How did it grow from 90,000 to 9 million today? This is a long way from the Louisiana experience. The answer is leadership. From the first days of our British leaders, and a sensible approach to federalism, making intelligent and thoughtful decisions designed to accommodate differences while keeping the country united. The Canadian approach and experiment with its setbacks and its limitations is one that Prime Minister Cameron may want to examine as he contemplates the challenges of Scotland. And why would he want to do this? Because it's worked for almost 150 years. Canada today is a wealthy, modern, united G7 nation, a leader of both the Commonwealth and la Francophonie, which makes an enormous contribution to the well-being of its own citizens and to those in developing countries around the world that need ongoing assistance and support. And this, in many ways, is overshadowed by the enormous contribution to the world by Great Britain, by the United Kingdom, and what it has done with its muscle and its economic power and its vision and its leadership over the centuries, and to suggest that this great country could not continue as a united nation to make one of the greatest contributions in world history to the advance of civilization simply does not resist serious examination. The challenges the Prime Minister face, faces with the European Union bear some resemblance as well to Canada's ongoing relationship with the United States, our closest neighbor, friend, and economic partner, on whom we depend for much of our prosperity, but who, at ten times our size, sometimes causes us problems with attitudes of distance and indifference to Canadian sensitivities and customs. I dealt with this delicate situation with the United States, not by withdrawing, but by deeper involvement and leadership. I decided in 1985 to negotiate a comprehensive free trade agreement, and I called President Reagan to say this is what I wanted to do, and would he join me, and he said yes. So it was the opposite of protectionism and withdrawal, and we hoped a leadership decision that would enhance Canadian sovereignty and strengthen Canadian prosperity. So now, some 30 years later, how did this all work out? Well, from the start, our basic objective had been to secure and enhance access to our major market. At a time of rampant protectionist actions by the United States Congress, securing that vital access for Canada on a more confident platform for Canadian exporters was absolutely essential. That is why a, a binding dispute settlement mechanism was the crunch issue in this negotiation for Canada. How could it be otherwise? With an economy ten times the size of ours, the United States could crush us in any dispute unless we were assured of fairness by some recognized instrument of judicial equality in resolving disputes. I had told our team no dispute settlement process, no deal. This was our bottom line. A key objective for any free trade agreement is to improve competitiveness. We knew that if we wanted to compete successfully in the world, we had to compete first and foremost on our own continent with our largest trading partner. Throughout the two-year negotiation that is now beginning for you here in the United Kingdom, the fundamental instruction I had given our negotiating team was that the agreement had to significantly improve our trade relationship with the U.S. Equally, we had resolved that no deal would be better than a bad deal. And that certainly guided our tactics up to the very end. We, of course, also recognized fully that such an agreement had to be good for both sides, or it would in the end fail in any ratification process in the court of public opinion. Does this sound somewhat similar to the general negotiating posture that Prime Minister Cameron has articulated vis-a-vis -vis the European Union and on which he has embarked with, I think, clarity and courage. 
In a decision that startled the Reagan administration, I recalled our chief negotiator signaling our deep discontent with the progress of negotiations after two years. The appointment of Secretary Jim Baker was President Reagan's response as the chief negotiator, replacing everybody else. He put Jim Baker in charge. And as all of us know here who've dealt with the American administration, that Reagan's appointment of Baker was a godsend for both parties. In the final moments on October 3rd, 1987, Baker had been networking strenuously with key congressional players, and several on his own negotiating team, led by Senator Lloyd Benston from Texas, refused to accept a formula for dispute settlement so vital to Canada. Baker was under no illusion that I wouldn't accept a deal that didn't include binding by national dispute settlement. And I'll tell you why in a second. At about 9.30 p.m. on a Saturday night, with fast-track authority about to expire at midnight, at midnight the deal is cooked, we're out. We can't proceed because we've lost fast-track. It's 9.30 at night, and Baker calls me in my Langevin Block office in Ottawa. And he says, you know, while we're very close to an agreement, I doubt that I can get the dispute settlement mechanism because congressional leaders have argued that it would dilute their constitutional sovereignty in matters of international trade. I thanked Baker, and I told him that as the talks were now in danger of imminent collapse and total failure, I was going to call President Reagan that Saturday night at Camp David to ask him what one question. And Baker says, and what's that? I said, well, Jimmy, I'm going to ask the president how it is that the United States of America can negotiate a major nuclear reduction treaty with its worst enemy, the Soviet Union, and it can't negotiate a free trade agreement with its best friend, Canada. Baker says, Prime Minister, can you give me 20 minutes? At about 10 p.m. that evening, and, and this part of it, I wasn't there. I was on the phone in Canada. My negotiators are in the Treasury Department in one of Baker's boardrooms. At ten, so I'm get, this is the official version from the ambassadors and negotiators. At 10 p.m. that evening, Secretary Baker burst into the ante room of his Treasury office which was being used by the senior Canadian delegation. He flung a handwritten note on the table and said, all right, you can have your goddamn dispute settlement mechanism. Now can we get the report to Congress before the whole bloody thing collapses? And that's exactly how it happened. We had selected our objective clearly. We had fought for it steadily and rationally. And I suspect that that is exactly the course that Prime Minister Cameron is on in regard to his negotiations. And to those who say, this doesn't count, to say that the free trade negotiations had been controversial in Canada would be the understatement of the decade. At one point, this, this debates about the pros and cons were unrelenting all across the country culminating in a riveting and fiercely fought uh, 1988 election campaign, which most historians describe as the most brutal in the history of Canada. In fact, at one point in time, this was so tough that my support was down to members of my immediate family. <laughs> I called my mother, and she put me on hold. <laughs> and I was paying for the call. <laughs> but one of my predecessors, Prime Minister Pearson, eloquently described a chronic problem facing any Canadian chosen to negotiate with Americans. This could be any Brit chosen to negotiate with Europe. It resembles somewhat the similar characterization heard in parts of the United Kingdom today as you open your discussions with Europe. And here's what Pearson said. The picture of weak and timid Canadian negotiators being pushed around and browbeaten by American representatives into settlements that were sellouts is a false and distorted one. 
It is often painted, however, by some Canadians who think that a sure way to get applause and support is to exploit our anxieties and exaggerate our suspicions over U.S. policies and politics. Critics of the initiative in Canada went to bizarre lengths to try and scare Canadians into believing that the sky would fall under free trade. Medicare, old age pensions, our water resources, our culture, all were said to be at risk. We faced a toxic cocktail of latent anti-American and narrow protectionist sentiments. They really pulled out all the stops on this one. As a prominent opposition leader in the House of Commons said, we're going to blame every sparrow that falls on free trade. Canadians were also repeatedly told that we couldn't compete with a country ten times our size. My government had more confidence in the ability of Canadian firms because if we couldn't compete successfully in North America, we certainly couldn't compete in the world. So I had to call a general election on this issue, as I say, one of the most brutal in our history. Fortunately, when confronted with a clear choice, Canadians rallied to our position, and we won the election again with a very strong majority. My government saw these negotiations as a major building block to future prosperity. We wanted to restrain the forces of protectionism, and in large measure, we did. But listen to this. What were we fighting about? Why all the sound? And why all of the important with, a, with what Prime Minister Cameron is doing today? Well, let me tell you. Trade volumes, after I signed the free trade agreement with President Reagan, trade volumes more than tripled in less than 20 years, from $235 billion in 1989 to $745 billion two decades later. Trade between Canada and the United States, as a result, exploded into the largest bilateral two-way exchanges of trade between any two countries in the history of the world. Let me try that again. In the history of the world. Two years ago, the United States of America did more business across one border point, the ambassador bridge between Windsor, Ontario and Detroit, Michigan, more trade across that one bridge than it did that year with the nation of Japan. This will give you an idea of what it was all about, where we created millions of new jobs and record prosperity on both sides of the border. In the two hours or so that we're here this evening, more than $200 million, we're just about there now, $200 million in goods and services will be exchanged by Canada and the United States. That is more than $1 million every minute of every hour, of every day, almost $2 billion in total, each and every day, of every week, of every month, of every year. So what did it mean? It meant 4.9 million new jobs in Canada. 4.9 million new jobs in Canada, and a doubling of our GDP. In fact, it more than doubled in that period. And so these are the kinds of sentiments that cleared the air for us of all doubts and fears about our capacity to grow and prosper as a mature, distinctive country, living as we do cheek by jowl, next to the richest and most powerful nation in world history. And it also has a collateral effect, and that is that the next time somebody points to a referendum and says Great Britain or Canada, the United Canada, are not protecting our ideas and our culture and our economy, you point to numbers like this, and that's all the ordinary guy wants to hear, because his job in life is to look after himself and his wife and his kids and their future. And if you're providing them with jobs and a chance for fairness and prosperity, they're on your side. There's nothing esoteric about it. It's just the way it is. 
The most essential ingredient for any big idea, however, is leadership. Leadership that not only anticipates the need for change, but is determined to implement change. Elections have a purpose. You just had one. We're going to have one in five months. Change that is not in pursuit of popularity, but to serve the national interest. The test of true leadership hinges on judgments between risk and reward. Change of any kind requires risk, lots of political risk. It can and will generate unpopularity from all those who oppose change. They don't want to move. They're the Luddites of this century. They don't want change. They want, there's something in the Canadian air that makes us immune from change. We don't have to do any, well, this Mulroney is a nut bar. Why is he trying to change us and drag us into some 21st century? We may not even get there. Why doesn't he leave us alone? Well, the choice for Canada or the United Kingdom in a fast-changing global environment is either to adapt quickly and take advantage of the changes happening or watch silently and ineffectively from the sidelines. If we truly deliver, we will not only enhance our economic prospects, but I am confident that we will enable Canada and the United Kingdom to play more relevant and effective roles on geopolitical issues of the moment. Thomas Darcy McGee, who was the most eloquent father of our Confederation, an immigrant from Ireland, in his last speech in the House of Commons before his assassination 147 years ago, famously said, he who seeks after popularity builds upon a shifting sand. Prime ministers are not chosen to seek popularity. They are chosen to provide leadership. As President Clinton once said, leadership is the capacity to look around the corner of history just a little bit. Leadership is the process not only of foreseeing the need for change, but of making the case for change. Leadership does not consist of imposing unpopular ideas on the public, but of making unpopular ideas acceptable to the nation. This requires a very solid argument for change and a very strong ability to make the argument over and over and over again. The impact of significant public policy decisions is often unclear in the early years. It sometimes takes a considerable period, frequently decades, before the full consequences of an important initiative become apparent. Look at the legacy of the person whose name is on this building, Margaret Thatcher. Look at what happened when history got to dealing with what she had sought to do and the extraordinary story of the British turnaround that she and her ministers and her colleagues had initiated. History takes a while to write. And you should avoid the immediate judgments of tomorrow morning's headlines. Because as Reinhold Niebuhr reminded us, nothing worth doing is completed in our lifetime. Therefore, we must be saved by hope. And nothing fine or beautiful or good makes complete sense in any immediate context of history. And therefore, we must be saved by faith. It is in this perspective that great and controversial questions of public policy must be considered. History tends to focus on the builders, the deciders, the leaders, in healthcare, in research, in medicine, in business, in the arts, because they are the men and women whose contributions have shaped the destiny of their great nations. From the bloodied sands of Afghanistan to the snows and waters of the high Arctic. The Canada of 50 years from now will be defined by the leadership we are given today. And if all of us remember that freedom and liberty are the very pillars of our national democracies, we can collectively make a contribution to the well-being of mankind that will bring honor to Canada and the United States and peace and prosperity to all of her citizens. Many years ago, many years ago, a leading American jurist who was never appointed to the Supreme Court of the United States, in a comment that I love, 
welcomed immigrants to America in the lower east side of Manhattan, Catholics, Protestants, Muslims, Jews, from the Middle East and Central and Eastern Europe. And he tried to describe for them what they could expect in their new country. He tried to define it for them. And because of his words, I think that the reach of his words is universal. It applies to all of us, all of our countries. Because it's what we, those of us in public life and those of us in business have strived to do, strive to achieve. He talked about the spirit of liberty. He said the spirit, of, as he spoke to these immigrants, the spirit of liberty is the spirit that is not too sure that it is right. The spirit of liberty seeks to understand the minds of other men and other women. The spirit of liberty weighs their interests alongside its own without bias. The spirit of liberty knows that not even a sparrow falls to earth unheeded. And the spirit of liberty is the spirit of him who near 2,000 years ago taught mankind a lesson that it has never quite learned but never quite forgotten, that there may be a kingdom where the least shall be heard and considered side by side with the greatest. The United Kingdom and Canada have devoted their lives and their treasure to that, the search for that spirit of liberty. And may, with your help and God's blessing, may we always continue to do so. Thank you. for a reception, uh, right just down, down the stairs. And Prime Minister, thank you so much for your, your excellent you. remarks. Thank you all. <laughs> <laughs>